Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video series where we talk a lot about the theory of so-called Fourier series. And in today's part 17, we will see what we can say about the pointwise convergence when we approximate a function with a Fourier series. But before we explain what this exactly means, I first want to thank all the nice people who support the channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And as you might know, if you support me, you can download a lot of additional material with the link in the description. For example, you find all the PDF versions and the Python code for this video there. Then I would say let's immediately start by considering a 2 pi periodic function. As always, the general case is a complex valued function, but our example today will be a real valued one. And there you know for such a function we can formulate the Fourier series and call it fnf. And the only requirement we choose here is that our function f is an L2 function. This means over one period the function is square integrable. And then we have already proven that our Fourier series converges to f with respect to the given L2 norm. So we always have that convergence, but it does not tell us anything about the pointwise convergence. To get this one, we definitely need some additional requirements. And indeed, in the last two videos, we have already discussed a sufficient condition, namely if we have a continuous function, which is also piecewise C1. In fact, in that case, we have the pointwise convergence because we have an even stronger one. Namely, we have shown that in this case, the Fourier series converges uniformly to the function f. And there you should know that the uniform convergence always implies the pointwise convergence. However, if we only want to talk about pointwise limits, we don't need the whole uniform convergence and we can definitely weaken the assumptions on the left hand side. And in fact, in today's video, we will see that both things, the continuity and the C1 property can be substituted by a weaker form. This means we will also be able to say something about functions with a jump. For example, it would be really nice to know what the Fourier series does for this function here. Of course, for fixed natural number n, our approximation f n f will always be a continuous function. So there will be no jump for f n f, but in the limit it could have the jump. But in this case, we also want to know what is the value at the jump point. This means we have to look at the value f n f at 0 and then we send n to infinity. So the question is does this limit exist and what is the value of it? And it turns out that we can answer that in a very general setting. Roughly speaking, the function f just has to be nice enough at this given point. This means we don't need such a general property for the whole function f because we can consider each point separately. So let's fix such a point and let's call it x hat. And since we are 2 pi periodic, we can take it from the interval minus pi to pi. And now our function f has to satisfy four conditions at this given point x hat. And actually they are quite simple. The first one just tells us that the limit coming from the left hand side exists. So we can write that as limit epsilon going to zero where epsilon has to stay positive of f of x hat minus epsilon. And there it does not matter which value we get, the only important thing is that this limit exists. And now you might already guess that in the same sense we also want that the limit from the right hand side exists. This is quite simple because there we only have to change the sign. So this is what we need, the two limits have to exist and we can abbreviate the values with a common name. Namely, we just write f of x hat minus and f of x hat plus. Obviously, we can immediately find these values in our picture. Namely, this one is f of x hat minus and this one here is f of x hat plus. And moreover, for a point where the function f is continuous, we know that both values coincide. However, for points x hat where f is not continuous, it simply does not matter where the value of f at x hat lies. Indeed, you can just remember that the Fourier series cannot see such a single value, it can only see the two limits. But this is also only correct if, in addition, we also have some differentiability conditions. More precisely, what we need is that the derivative from the left hand side exists 
and the derivative from the right hand side. Hence the slope of the function has to exist if we only approach it from one side. So as always we just have to subtract the two values and divide by the difference h. And then when we send h to 0 we get the derivative of f at the point x hat. And now as before if we want to do it one sided we have to say we come from the left hand side so our h is negative. So there we have our one sided slope and we want that this exists as well. And in a similar way from the right hand side it should exist as well. And in fact we don't need more than that so the two values don't have to coincide. So you can just remember that we can consider both sides separately. And by having these four conditions we get a really nice result out. Namely we get that the Fourier series f and f converges point wisely at the given point x hat. This means if we fix our x hat here we have a sequence of complex numbers. And the result is that this sequence converges to a fixed complex number. Which is exactly the value of f at x hat if f is continuous at x hat. However in the case we have a jump at x hat we get the middle point between the two limits. So you could just say we get the arithmetic mean of both possible values. And again please note that the original value of f at x hat does not matter at all it's just about the two limits from left and right. So this is important to remember it means that at a jump point we don't necessarily get the value of the function f back. This means we can only have pointwise convergence of the Fourier series at every point if the original function already has this property that the values are the middle points. But with that in mind now you see that we have a weaker sufficient condition for the pointwise convergence of the Fourier series. However before we write down the proof of it I first want to make this example more concrete. So we consider exactly the same thing as before but now I want to fix all the numbers in the picture. In particular the value of the jump should be given by pi. This means our 2 pi periodic function f is quite simple. On the one side it's just a constant function and on the other side it's a linear function. And moreover we immediately get that the linear function is just given as pi minus x. And that's the whole thing and then we can extend it to pi periodically. And now obviously we are interested in the Fourier series in particular in the value at the point 0. In fact the theorem tells us that this value should be given as pi over 2. So let's see if that comes out when we calculate the whole Fourier series. And at this point you know how to do that we just have to determine the Fourier coefficients. So as always we just have the inner product e k with f. Which is given as an integral and please don't forget the factor 1 over 2 pi in front of it. And now we can put in our function f of x which means we can change this integral from 0 to pi. And inside the integral we just have pi minus x. So not a complicated integral at all because you already know that integration by parts works here. However in order to do that we have to take out the case k is equal to 0. Indeed for this case we just have to integrate the function f so we get out the area of this triangle here. Which is exactly half of the square which has an area of pi squared. Hence we immediately get pi over 4 for the case k is equal to 0. And as already mentioned for all the other cases we just have to do the integration by parts to solve this integral. And there I will not do the details I just tell you the result. So first we get minus 1 over k squared times minus 1 to the power k. This is not so surprising because that is the common factor we get when we have the exponential function at minus i k pi. However we also have the lower limit here so we get the exponential function at 0 as well. And this one is also multiplied by minus 1 over k squared so we can put everything into parentheses. And finally the last term from the integration by parts is minus i times pi divided by k. And that's it now we have all the Fourier coefficients which means we can form our Fourier series. So I would say for every natural number n let's write down the function we get here. 
This means it's a well-defined finite sum that starts with the constant pi over 4. And then we just add up all the exponential functions from minus n to plus n. So in short, we just have c k times e to the power i k x. And there, as a quick reminder, you know we can also represent the Fourier series with cosine and sine functions. And this does not change the function at all, so the constant stays the same for sure. And on the other hand, all the other parts we can put into two sums that go from 1 to n. And inside the first sum we have the cosine functions, and inside the second sum we have the sine functions. And there the names for the coefficients are a, k and b, k. It's not complicated at all to get them, because we can immediately calculate them from the coefficients c, k. In fact, it's just Euler's formula altogether, and a k can be written as c k plus c minus k. And on the other hand, for b k, we have to subtract both coefficients. However, since there is an i in Euler's formula for the sine function, we have to multiply with i as well. So I would say you can definitely remember these two formulas, because they are always helpful if you want to visualize a real valued function simply because in this case the coefficients a, k and b, k are real numbers as well. For example, if we calculate b, k, we just get out 1 over k. So this is quite simple, but on the other hand, a, k is a little bit longer. We get 1 over pi times 1 over k squared times 1 minus minus 1 to the power k. Okay, so I wrote this down because with this knowledge we can quickly visualize our Fourier series in a plot. And as always I want to use Python to draw our original function f and the corresponding Fourier series. So you see here we just start with the constant, so this one is exactly pi over 4. Then we can go one step higher, which means we have a cosine function and a sine function combined. Moreover, what we can also put in is the value pi over 2 at the origin, because we already know that the Fourier series will converge to this point at the origin in the limit n to infinity. This means when we increase n, we will see that the Fourier series will get closer and closer to that point. In fact, after only a few steps we already see that behavior, and we might also recognize the pointwise convergence at all the other points. So I think that's already good enough for our visualization. If you want to see more steps, you can use the Python script linked in the description. Now we just go back to the calculation, and there we already know that in the limit at the point 0, we get out pi over 2. However, this has an immediate consequence for our sums, our infinite series, here on the right hand side. This means there we can also put in 0 for the point x, which implies that the second sum completely vanishes. Indeed, the sine of 0 is just 0, so nothing remains there. However, we still have the whole sum for the cosine functions, so there we get something out. We have our coefficient a k, and then times the cosine at 0, which is 1. This implies that we get a value for this infinite sum on the right hand side. To see that, just subtract pi over 4 and multiply with the factor pi. So again, we see that the Fourier series theory can help us to calculate explicit sums. So maybe this particular formula is not completely new, but now you see you could use different functions f to get some sum formulas out. So this is quite helpful and interesting enough that I would say we should use the next video to prove the fact that the Fourier series actually converges to this middle point. This will need some work, so I hope you are excited for the next video. So let's meet again and have a nice day. Bye bye.